Is there a bias against men and boys in psychological research? I think so. Just as TV bashes and stereotypes men, we see similar sorts of things in psychological research where men and boys are simply ignored and marginalized. Don't believe it? Okay, let's look at a study from Great Britain on teen dating violence. This study was done in 2009 by the NSPCC, and it used questionnaire data from over 1,300 teens to try and understand teen partner violence. What they found was that boys and girls were both victims and perpetrators of teen partner violence. Here are some of the findings. Boys were 41% of the victims of emotional violence in teen relationships. Boys were 42% of the victims of physical partner violence in teen relationships. Boys were 34% of the victims of sexual partner violence in teen relationships. Boys were one-third of those who were victims of rape. Girls reported using violence in relationships three times as often as boys. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The study is filled with data from their questionnaires that repeatedly shows that boys and girls are both victims and perpetrators of teen partner violence. Read through the 209-page research report and you'll get an eyeful. But here's the problem. Even though the full report showed boys to be victims, the farther you move away from the full report, the more boys disappear. Read the executive summary and see how girls start taking the lion's share of the researchers' concerns. Then move a step farther and look at the press release, which focuses almost entirely on girls. Have a look. The headline reads, Teen Girls Abused by Boyfriends, warns NSPCC. Then notice the first, second, and third paragraphs are all about girls. Teenage girls in relationships suffer unwanted sexual acts. One in 16 girls said they had been pressured into sex. A quarter of the girls had suffered physical violence and on and on and on about girls, but almost nothing about boys. It's all about girls. But it gets worse. Look at the headlines from media stories about this research. One in three teenage girls tell of sexual abuse by their boyfriends third of teen girls pressured into sex. One in three teen girls has been sexually abused by a boyfriend. It's all about girls. But that's not the worst of it. Decisions were made resulting from this research about what could be done to aid the teen partner violence problem that had been detected and somehow the decision makers read the research and came up with an ad campaign that used internet, print, radio, and television ads that wait for it, helped girls who were victims of partner violence and taught boys not to be violent. So we do a spot study that shows boys and girls are both having a tough time in dealing with relationship violence, and what do we do? Once we start sending out taxpayers' money, we only help the girls. That's insane. I call this the See No Evil study. Yeah, we gathered the data that showed that boys and girls were both victims, but, well... We just didn't look at the boys' side. We ignored it and just focused on the girls. That is called misandry. Our second study brings us an interesting question. Can researchers' attachment to their ideology of women as victims and men as perpetrators drive them to misrepresent their studies in order to further their ideology in the media? We'll see. This study has to do with reproductive coercion. Most of us are familiar with the idea that women will sometimes intentionally not take birth control pills or will poke holes in a condom in order to get pregnant against her partner's wishes. However, this research tells us that it's the men who are doing the condom poking and coercion. I checked the study out on the web and was startled to see their statistical claims. Many of the articles said that 53% of women surveyed had experienced violence in her relationship. Wow, I thought, that's over half the respondents. That's quite a few. I read on and other stats were quoted that were equally shocking about women suffering from reproductive coercion at the hands of their male significant others. I began to wonder how they got such alarming statistics. I searched and found plenty of media articles on the web on this research. One from Newsweek, one from Science Daily, one from Medical News Today, one from eScience News, one from LA Times, and others. They all made similar claims about this study and often used the same quotes and the same statistics. All of the articles talked about this study as if it applied to the general population. 
Then I found a college newspaper article from the Aggie, the student newspaper of the University of California, Davis. It happened to be the school of the lead researcher in the study. It's worth noting that the article states that none of the coordinators on campus at the Women's Resource and Research Center had ever seen this kind of abuse. Hmm, never seen this kind of abuse. Hmm. Then further in the article, they say something shocking that was omitted from all of the other media articles. The Aggie article astoundingly said that the study was done on an impoverished population of females. It went on to say that according to the researchers, the study should not be generalized outside of poor clinics. Wow. Should not be generalized? All of the national articles we've been seeing were generalizing the study as if it applied to everyone. The researchers didn't seem to tell the national media about their sample being mostly poor females. These national articles were now spreading misinformation. At least the exaggerated stats started to make some sense. The Department of Justice tells us plainly that intimate partner violence is much greater in impoverished settings. Here's a chart from their web page. Notice that for those couples whose income is above 25000 each, there is a much smaller chance of being a victim of intimate partner violence. Much smaller. Note also that these women in the lowest socioeconomic brackets are over six times more likely to be victims of intimate partner violence. That's a huge difference. Here's the problem. The researchers didn't mention that their sample was impoverished women in the journal article or in their press release. The media then mistakenly portrayed this study as if it applied to the general population not knowing the facts of the true sample. The quoting of 53% victims of violence in relationship and all the other eye-popping stats may have been true for the population studied, but it is far from true for the rest of the nation. We know the researchers made a mistake that has sent misinformation to millions of Americans. We just don't know if the mistake was intentional. I wrote to the lead researcher and asked her why the socioeconomic status of the sample was not published in the journal article. I also asked her if she was concerned about the misinformation that had been sent through the media to millions of people who assumed the study applied to everyone. She's not answered either question. There's more that's wrong with this study. Notice that they didn't interview the men who were accused. They only interviewed the women who claimed to be the victims. That's a bit suspect, but even worse is that the only questions they asked the women were about their own victimization. There were no questions asked of those surveyed about their own coercive behaviors. None. This leaves the study only asking the questions that will show women as victims and men as perpetrators. It all makes me wonder, how about you? I call this study the Speak No Evil study. Yes, we know about our sample, but we just aren't going to say anything. The last study we'll look at is the Conformity to Masculine Norms Inventory, the CMNI. This is an inventory that claims to measure men's degree of conformity to masculine norms. The major problem is that some of the norms it chooses seem to be more about male bashing than about a true representation of masculinity in our culture. First, let's have a look at the norms that have been used in psychological research since the 1970s. Look at the list of masculine norms from left to right. Independent, competent, not feminine, aggressive, forceful, assertive, confident, risk taker, yeah, all pretty close. Then look at the CMNI in 2003. Masculine norms now include violence, power over women, disdain for homosexuality, and playboy. We've gone from fairly good descriptions to male bashing. I asked the researcher how these norms were chosen, and he claimed that he drew them from the literature. He sent me an article that could help me understand. Take the Playboy example. It was drawn from a 15-year-old book that listed Playboy as one of the masculine ways of loving, along with faithful husband, breadwinner, and nurturer. But the researcher chose Playboy as representative of masculine norms, even though the book author stated that less than 1% of the men surveyed chose Playboy as their dominant role. Hmm. Yes, some men are surely violent, but violence is far from a masculine norm. Rather than a norm, violence is when things fall apart. It's when the male role of provide and protect breaks down. To cast all men as having a norm of violence is hateful towards men. I think this inventory might be better named Conformity to Middle School Masculine Norms. This is far from the mature masculine. The focus groups that made the decision on these norms? The majority were women, and all were in their early to mid-twenties. 
asking such a young group to designate the roles of men of all ages seems pretty futile. I call this one the Hear No Evil Study. It simply won't hear that most men are good human beings. As always, speak up and let folks know that men are good.